Well, good evening. Welcome back to Community Baptist Church uh, for our time to worship the Lord together. And I'm looking forward to uh, looking at our church covenant again this evening. I've been doing a series uh, gradually through uh, our church covenant. And so we'll be talking about that uh, tonight as I preach from the word. Um, Before we get into the worship portion of our service, uh, I'd just like to update you on some announcements of things going on in the life of our church. Um, The first thing is uh, tomorrow morning, our monthly men's breakfast will be at uh, A&P on Highway 14. Uh, That's at 9 o'clock tomorrow. So men, just a reminder, if you can make make it out to that, it would be great. Um, Not this coming week, but the following week, uh, our ladies' Bible studies are going to be starting up again. Um, We have one on Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock, and then another one on Tuesday evening at 7 o'clock in the home of uh, Jackie Allen. So the one on Tuesday mornings is here at the church. The one on on Thursday nights is at the Allen's home. So um, if you are interested in that, uh, Sherry Dibagno has, uh, for those of you who have ordered copies, uh, Becoming a Woman of Prayer for the study, uh, you can uh, touch base with her ladies. And if you're interested in in attending that class, I encourage you to talk to to Sherry, uh, one of our ladies. They can um, help uh, direct you and give you some more information about that. I know it's been a really big encouragement to our ladies and I hope it continues to be so as we go into um, this this coming year. Another thing that I want to point out is on the 24th, uh, so that's a week from Wednesday, we have our annual business meeting. We have quarterly business meetings, but this is really the big one where we uh, look at the budget from the previous year and the vote on the budget for the coming year. So I'd encourage you to uh, make time to come for that meeting. We'll get a good report of things that have come from the previous year and then uh, looking into the future, uh, what God has in store for us then. So i uh, love to see you there. Those are all the announcements that we have for this evening, so I'm going to start us in a word of prayer, and then after that, Pastor Steve's going to come, and we'll begin singing together in song. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity we've had today to be encouraged by your word, to be encouraged with fellowship with one another, to have the opportunity to worship you, and uh, as we come before you this evening, uh, we are mindful, Lord, of our need Uh, to love you more and to love one another more. And that might sound like a simple theme, but it really is not. It's really the heartbeat of everything that you've called us to do and to be. And so help us not to take it lightly. Help us not to overlook it. Lord, we pray that you would give us grace and strength uh, to uh, follow after you. We know that you never ask us to do something that you do not give us the grace to do. So we do pray for your grace and your strength, even as we go into this week, Lord, that uh, this service tonight would encourage us and pre- prepare us and propel us into another week of faithful service to you. Lord, we um, think of uh, Diane's surgery coming up here on the 23rd. I pray that you would help her as uh, um, the, they need uh, your grace and your wisdom, Lord. Um, I know that has been a concern for the Backricks, and um, I pray that you would lay the, the questions and the, um, uh, the fears to, to rest in their heart, that we would uh, come around them and encourage them uh, during this time. Lord, now we pray for Kate Heinemann as she goes to Italy for this culinary arts school, that uh, this would be a real uh, beneficial time for her, that she would learn to steward Uh, her gifts for your glory, and that uh, she'd be able to plug in with uh, good believers there in uh, the city that she's at, Lord, um, so that she can uh, be built up and encouraged in the Lord, and she can encourage others as well. And uh, let this be a real uh, real good next step for her in her spiritual growth and service for you. Lord, we think of the Mayfields uh, right now in Ecuador, with all the conflict that's going on there and the uncertainty. We thank you, Lord, that they're safe and that they've been able to uh, continue ministry to some extent. And we pray that you would give them continued wisdom with the ministry that they have, God. They uh, so uh, desperately need our prayers and our love and care for them. Lord, we thank you that uh, they'll be coming here uh, this year, uh, visiting 
uh, back for their first visit to the States uh, since they've gone to the field. And we're just so grateful and blessed that we can be their sending church and have a, have Greenville as their home base. And I pray that they would have a really good visit. Uh, we think of uh, many other missionaries who will be coming back and visiting with us, Lord, the Thompsons from Japan, Bjerks from Croatia, and Lord, other visiting missionaries this year. We pray, Father, that um, as they prepare uh, these details and coming back to the States, that you'd bless their endeavors as they lay their plans, Lord, give them wisdom, help them to be able to plan their schedules well as they uh, find all the different visits they have with the, the churches that they meet here. We pray that they'd be able to get good time with family and with friends that would be encouraging for them. And Lord, I pray, help them to know uh, that we have um, really held them up in prayer and help the time that they have with us to be beneficial and encouraging. And now this evening, we pray, God, that the songs that we sing and the scripture we read and the, the praise that we offer to you would truly please and, and glorify you. And we thank you that we have confidence that this can be the case because we come in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his precious name we pray all these things. Amen. We heard this song played this morning by the uh, Kimmy on the violin. It's a beautiful song, and the lyrics to this song are, are really, um, it's a prayer. It's a prayer, and, and when we read the Psalms, mo you read the Psalms, those are Psalms of prayer to God, and that's what this is, O great God of highest heaven, occupy my lowly heart. And there might be times when this song might not mean uh, a lot to you, but there's, there'll be times I think everybody We'll see this song, it's a, a song of confession as well. And I trust that the words will speak to your heart, that will be a blessing to you and a challenge that we know that we can always go to God in prayer and we can ask for his uh, help and his strength. Oh, great God of highest heaven, let's stand to sing this song. <clears throat>
may be seated. Scripture reading tonight is 1 John chapter 4, verses 15 to 21, English Standard Version. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must love his brother. First John. 4, 15 to 21. Hymn number 431, Servant's Heart. This is a song that hasn't been sung in a while, so you might want to grab your hymn book and sing along. Um, how many already know this song? Just so I can see. Oh, you know this. It's just been a while. It's been a while since it's been sung. So only two verses, but we've been singing about our, our love, our great God, behold our God, and come let us adore him. We love the Lord with all our hearts. And this is a, a prayer, a song of prayer saying, Lord, help me to be a servant's heart. Help me to show love to others. And we could do that in so many different ways of showing our love and our care and concern for others. So let's stand again to sing, Make Me a Servant Like You, Dear Lord. <clears throat>
of a better uh, song to lead into what we'll be talking about this evening. We're going to be in Matthew 22 as we start out, but we're going to be flipping around to a couple of passages, so just get your fingers ready, warning you. We're going to be looking at several things as we consider uh, the love of God this evening. Why don't we begin with a word of prayer and ask God to bless our time together in his word. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you have shown us your love and shed it abroad in our hearts through the work of your Son, Jesus Christ. And there is no better prayer than to respond in asking you to help us, to have a servant's heart, Lord. Give us a heart of love for you, and then let that overflow into love for others. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, now that we've entered into a new year, tax season is right around the corner, isn't it? Perhaps you've already started gathering documents for your taxes, and one thing that we can be sure of is taxes will not be simple, will they? The tax code is long, and even how long it is is debated for political reasons, but in order to actually understand our tax code, we need almost 75,000 pages to explain the tax code. In other words, it takes the average adult about 14 weeks to read the IRS's tax regulations and guidelines just on the taxes. So with all those words, it's no wonder that people would sometimes complain that the tax law is too complex. Wouldn't it be nice to have a simple way just to understand all of that? Well, the same is true when we're faced with the complexities of Scripture. We need a simple way to understand it all. And you know, Jesus in the gospel, at Gospels actually distills the entire Bible into two simple commandments. Love God and love others. And as we continue through the church covenant tonight, we've highlighted this very clear command as the first item of what we've done. So far, we've kind of covered the preamble of the church covenant, the prerequisites, of what the members are like, and how what we covenant together uh, in some of the things we agree on. But now we're getting to the nitty-gritty of what, what we actually do. What does God expect us to do? The first line in the second paragraph of our covenant says this, We will endeavor to walk together daily in Christian love and compassion. And I think that's the best place to start with a church covenant. But this is very hard to do in real life. How are we to go about loving God and loving others? Well, in Matthew chapter 22, we enter a passage at the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. He has made his final journey to Jerusalem. Earlier in the week, he had his triumphal entry where the people were singing his praises, but the religious leaders were seething out of jealousy. Jesus then goes in and cleanses the temple for the second time, and he further challenges the religious leader's authority. And now they're going to respond by trying to catch Jesus in his words. And why is that? Because they have murder in their hearts. The Pharisees send their own disciples and the Herodians in verse 16 of Matthew chapter 22, but they fail to trap Jesus in his words. So along come the Sadducees in verse 23, and the very same day, they fail to trap Jesus in his words. And in the eyes of the people, the cream of the crop really were the Pharisees. They were the big guns. And at this point, they had no choice. They were forced to gang up on Jesus, as it were. So we read in verse 34, but when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Here's the trap. Jesus had said a lot of things that the Jews thought were pretty radical about the law of God. He had used the law of God to indict the Pharisees time and time again. And so the intellectually elite of this religious class, a Pharisaical lawyer, confronts Jesus this lawyer, which would be the same as a scribe, would be equivalent to our, in our day to a Ph.D. graduate in theology, a tenured seminary professor. This man was incredibly smart and highly respected. And his question is one with massive implications. Out of the 613 commands in the Old Testament, which one is the most important? How do they all fit together? 
Is there some sort of hierarchy of laws where some had greater importance and less importance? Then Jesus would have known the Old Testament law, especially the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, by heart. Boys in Israel were taught to memorize the entire Pentateuch in their synagogue schools. And if someone became a rabbi, they were expected to master the law. And Jesus has mastered God's word. He answers by making what could have been a very complex topic very simple for us. He tells us to love God and to love others. That's our first point tonight, love God and love others. Notice in verse 37, and he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. Jesus made it clear our highest priority as Christians is to love God. And he took these words from Deuteronomy chapter 6. Every devout Jew would have known what Jesus was talking about. It's kind of like us quoting John 3.16 today. They call this passage the Shema. And there's a great deal of evidence that devout Jews would have quoted this passage twice a day. It was central to their worship. Worship. It says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And there's a lot of things we could note about this passage, but here let's just notice two simple things. First of all, it begins with the statement in verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now Jesus doesn't quote it here in Matthew 22, but later when we get into Mark, we'll see that he does. And this statement is affirming the fundamental unity of God. We know that God is three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, And in Israel's day, these words would have reminded the Israelites that their God was the one and true God, as opposed to all the false gods in the surrounding nations. All the nations surrounding Israel had their own system of gods. Really, nowhere else in the pagan nations do you find a concept similar to a singular devotion to one God that Israel had. It was unique among the nations. Yahweh said, I am the maker of the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. Worship me. So really, this is a call of radical devotion to one God. No split loyalties. Notice the second point in verse 5. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. The repetition of these terms emphasizes the totality and completeness of your love. It's all that you have. And when it talks about the heart, that's referring to your mind and your emotions. The word soul refers to your identity, the totality of who you are. And the word might refers to your resources. What has God given to you? Your physical strength, your natural talents, your bank account, your family, your employees, your social status, your time, everything you own. God lays claim to all of it, and he calls us to give him all of it. Eric Liddell was the Scottish Olympic gold medal runner as well known in the 1924 Paris Olympics because he refused to run on Sunday because he believed it would be dishonoring to God. Could you imagine if a professional athlete did something like that today with the Super Bowl coming up? He withdrew from the best event, his best event, the 100-meter sprint held on a Sunday and entered instead in the 400-meter race. In that race, he won the gold medal and set the new Olympic record of a time of a quarter of a mile in 47.6 seconds. Liddell then gave up his fame and fortune to return to China, the place where his parents had served as missionaries. He's known for saying this, I believe God made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. He died separated from his wife and family in a Japanese internment camp in World War II. You see, whether he was running on an Olympic track or sharing the gospel of Christ with the people of China, Liddell gave all that he had out of love for God. It was a wholehearted devotion. 
Now, here's the connection to our church covenant. If we love God wholeheartedly, if we give him all that we have, heart, soul, mind, and strength, it will show in our love for each other. Just as Liddell gave his life to serve others and tell them of the good news of Jesus Christ in China, so we must give our lives serving others. Jesus said in John 13, 35, By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And because we love God, we're called to love others. So that's the second point, and we see it here in verse 39 of Matthew chapter 22. Jesus says, And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. That word depend is really interesting. It has the idea of hanging something. In our dining room, there is a very big mirror on the wall that is very heavy. And I would never want it to fall on a guest or on, on my own children. So I had to get two very strong hooks to mount that mirror onto the wall. And I had to make sure that their weight limit was sufficient enough to hold up the weight of the mirror. If you don't have the right hooks, you'll never be able to hold up the mirror. And Jesus is saying that these two commandments function like hooks that hold up all of the law of Scripture. That's really how the Shema is used in Deuteronomy 6. It's a summary introduction to the law upon which everything else hangs. And Jesus is on equally good footing from this statement because he's quoting the Pentateuch once again. Both the Pharisees and the Sadducees would have agreed with him because Leviticus 19.18 says, You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Now, Jesus is not saying the second commandment takes priority over the first commandment. We don't love other people more than we love God, and our love for other people is not equal to the love we should have for God. But his point is, we can't divorce the two from each other. They cannot be separated. A love for people logically flows out of a love for God. And a love for God without a love for people is no true love at all. What kind of love should we show to other people then? Well, notice verse 39 again. He says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Quite simply, it's the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. We're told to put ourselves into the shoes of other people and treat them exactly how we'd want to be treated in the similar circumstances, according to the law of God. You know, it's common in self-help books, even Christian ones, for us to say that we should learn to love ourselves more. But the Bible actually assumes that we already love ourselves a lot. And on the basis of that natural self-love, we naturally take care of and fend for ourselves. This self-preserving instinct should be used for the good of other people. Jesus did not simply dismiss the law. Instead, he says that the law actually shows us what love for God and love for other people look like. It's an expression of God's love for us. Here's an example from the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 8 says this, When you build a new house, you shall make a parapet for your roof, that you may not bring the guilt of blood upon your house if anyone should fall from it. Simple question, do you want guests falling off of your roof? No, so build a fence around it because you love people. Now, of course, the Old Testament law can get much more complicated than this, but this is a good, simple example, and really all of the law boiled down to this, learning to love God and learning to love other people. In the New Testament, we find that we still have a law of God that's called the law of Christ and a simple way we follow this principle now is by bearing one another's burdens. We're told in Galatians 6 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 26, if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. You know, we are the family of God. And we're called to gather around one another to share our sorrows and to celebrate our joys. 
And I do hope and pray that we as a church body would do that. I do see evidences of that all the time that are so encouraging. And my prayer is that this would abound yet more and more as we love one another. But even beyond that, even beyond the walls of this assembly, do we love the body of Christ God has given us in America? Do we love the global church? How we speak about and how we act towards our brothers in Christ either reflects a love for God and a love for others, or it doesn't. And everything Jesus has said to his lawyer makes sense. The two seem to agree that they're called to love God and love others. So what's the big fuss? Why do the religious rulers hate Jesus so much? Well, we find out through a simple question they ask him in Luke chapter 10. And so let's turn there together, and we'll consider this question that they ask after Jesus gives his answer. We're just going to kind of compare all the Gospels together tonight on the statement that Jesus makes. In Luke chapter 10, we find a discussion that happened very likely early on in the ministry of Jesus. We don't see anything in the surrounding context that makes us think that this is happening at the end of Jesus' ministry, like we just saw in Matthew. And it's possible because, uh, you know, it could be possible these are the same conversations. But the reality is this probably came up multiple times. This question about the greatest command was something people would have asked Jesus about a lot. And it reveals the heart of the issue. So here in Luke chapter 10, look at verse 25 with me. And notice where the discussion goes to. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, Jesus, that is, said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. So end of story, right? Theologically, everyone agrees. So it must not be a problem. Wrong. Notice what happens next. Verse 29, but he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus pricks this pharisaical lawyer's conscience The Pharisees debated about this principle. What they tried to do was carefully qualify who was deserving of their love. They tried to excuse their own failure to love people and their failure to love God by blame shifting and making careful theological nuances. But Jesus says, avoid that trap. Instead of entering into a debate over who was worthy of this man's love, Jesus tells a story. Love is tied to action, so Jesus steps out of the logical arm wrestling and gets really practical. He replies, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Then he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and then, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. This priest most likely would have been a Pharisee. Someone like this lawyer. You remember the high priests of Israel? They were the most important religious figures in the nation. They were in good with the Roman government, and they called the shots when it came to the Jewish people. They're also a part of the priestly line, so they had a pure pedigree. They also had money, lots of money. He sees this man lying naked and beaten on the road. That's a pretty nasty job. He wouldn't want to make himself ceremonially unclean. Don't want to break all those special laws he's made for himself. It also take up a lot of precious time and his precious money. But here's a person in desperate need. He'll die if no one helps him. But no one's around to see me help him. They'll never know. Never mind the greatest commandments. He walks by. So likewise, a Levite, verse 32 when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Levites weren't quite as high on the totem pole in the religious structure of Israel, but they did help keep things organized in the temple. They often helped with the music and the worship. They were of the Levitical line, a pure pedigree once again, lots of wealth, lots of influence, but this man will die if no one helps him. It's a messy job, lots of time, Lots of money. No one's around. No one will know. He walks by. Verse 33. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, 
came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. A Samaritan. You know, when the northern kingdom of Israel was conquered by Assyria, the Assyrians forced the Israelites in that region to, uh, uh, well, they forced foreign groups to immigrate into that region, and then the Israelites intermingled with these nations that they imported into the northern kingdom and really tried to subdue Israel through syncretism and inter intermarriage. It was an Assyrian tactic to keep their conquered lands peaceful. So the Jews in the south considered the Samaritans a half-breed, as it were, between Jew and Gentile. And these Samaritans even formed their own syncretistic religion. So they're not of pure pedigree. Jesus could not have chosen a more despised hero in their eyes. And you know the story. Verse 34, he went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. This Samaritan took the equivalence of a day's wage, which in South Carolina averages out to around $250, $260. He gave it to the Hampton Inn manager and he said, take care of him. And whatever you, more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. So here's the question Jesus asks these Pharisaical lawyers. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And this self-righteous Pharisee can't even bring himself to spit out the words, the Samaritan, because he hates Samaritans. They're half-breeds. There's no way they could be righteous. So instead he says, verse 37, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. You see what Jesus has done here? He has picked out the most despicable person in their eyes in the story and presented him as a hero, someone this lawyer would have hated. And Jesus says, look, the question is not who is my neighbor. The question is, how can I be a neighbor? Stop trying to qualify who you show your love to. Just start showing it. The Samaritan knew how to show the love of God to a poor stranger. Why couldn't the Levite? Why couldn't the priest? Why couldn't the lawyer? It's because this, you cannot truly love your neighbor unless you truly love God first. They didn't love God. They loved themselves. They were more self-righteous. So Jesus says later in Matthew, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint, and dill and cumin. They're so careful about all these little parts of the law and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Jesus doesn't say their tithing is wrong. He says they're wrong for failing to live out justice and mercy and faithfulness towards their neighbor. He's accusing them of spiritual hypocrisy, claiming to love others, but betraying this by the way they lived their lives. Their actions spoke louder than their words. They loved themselves. They loved their own righteousness. And it'd be easy for us to sit back and, and to condemn these self-righteous Pharisees for hypocrisy, but we need this reminder too, don't we? We need to remember that the greatest of these is love. I'm reminded of the theme song from Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Remember what he always asked every time on that show? Please won't you be my neighbor? It was a kid's show, and that might seem silly or simple, but those words really capture the spirit of loving kindness that invited in and won so many kids over to a show as they truly felt that he actually cared about them. And this is what I appreciate about God's word it is so deep and so wide that you can spend a lifetime in it and not plumb the depths of God's loving kindness. And yet at the same time, it is so easy to understand and to apply. We are called to love others. And nowhere in the New Testament is God more clear about what this looks like than in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. There God tells us uh, through the Apostle Paul, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, 
I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. It's just noise. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. And it was over 10 years ago on a summer evening in July in a service that I stepped into this very pulpit and preached my infamous Exodus sermon. Some of you know what that was about because you were here and you still remember it. Not because it was an amazing sermon, but because it lasted an hour and seven minutes. <laughs> Talk about patience. And you all have been extremely patient with me over the years and I'm very thankful it's just a little snippet of what love looks like. 1 Corinthians 13 tells us that love is also kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Has God been clear to us in his word on this matter? He has. And it might be helpful for you to take this passage, 1 Corinthians 13, write it down on a postcard, memorize it, uh, a note card, memorize it, and maybe take good Bible translations, read them side by side, compare how they talk about it or meditate on it, whatever it takes for you to let this seep into your soul. It matters. These are the greatest commandments. Can we underline this anymore? And you know what you'll find when you try to apply 1 Corinthians 13 to your life? You'll find out that you can't do this on your own. I try to do this on my own, and I fail miserably. It's, it's hard to love God, and it's hard to love people all the time. Our flesh rages, doesn't it? We're selfish, proud people. So when we ask the question, how can I love my neighbor, we find that the answer is through the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you turn back with me, back to Mark chapter 12, we find we come back to our setting that we had in the beginning so you had another passage on this truth. The religious rulers are seeking to trap Jesus, but they failed. So we're very familiar with this conversation. But in light of what we've learned tonight, I just want you to notice what Jesus says to the scribe when he agrees with Jesus. The two greatest commands are to love God and love your neighbor. Look at the conversation at the end of verse 34. We're in Mark chapter 12, verse 34. And when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he basically agrees, yes, these are the two greatest commands. He said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any questions. Jesus says to this scri scribe, after agreeing with him completely about his theology, you are almost saved. You think about that? You see why now the religious leaders would hate him? Jesus knew the Bible, but he also knew their souls. He knew they had murder in their hearts, and they hated him. They were attacking him, seeking to trap him in his words. And for those religious rulers, the root issue was, not, was that they would not accept God's love as expressed in Jesus the Messiah. They would not confess their need for a Savior, especially one that looked like Jesus. Jesus challenged everything that they coveted for themselves, their popularity, their power, their wealth. He exposed their hypocrisy because they could not love God because they did not love Jesus. And the same thing is true for you and for me. If we don't believe in Jesus, if we don't believe in the gospel, we cannot love God or others. The Bible calls us to repent of our sins and our utter failure of living up to the standard of loving God and others, and then glory in God's love for us. The greatest commandments show us that we are a great failure, but at the same time, we have God's great love to rely on. Think about this. God loves us in Christ Jesus. Jesus fulfilled the law. 
He taught its true meaning. He demonstrated what it looks like. And so we read in 1 John chapter 4, the encouraging words. In this is love, not that we have loved God. We didn't love him first. But that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation. That's the atoning sacrifice for our sins. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. I mean, God loved us so much that he let our punishment fall on his son, like we talked about this morning. It was on the cross that Christ in perfect love cried out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And it's this love of God, it's his grace and his motivating power that enables us to love him back. God never asks you to do something he doesn't empower you to do. So we love because he first loved us. So I think it's important for us to recognize that we cannot work up love for other people by some kind of willful self-resolve. Instead, it's anchored firmly in God's grace. The apostle John, the apostle of love, reminded us, we love because he first loved us. And that's why I say meditate on 1 Corinthians 13 and put the name Jesus in there. Jesus is kind. Jesus is patient. That's love. And then ask Jesus to help you become more like him. So we can love others as we look to our loving God and draw on his deep mercy and the grace that he provides for us. And I think it's kind of like learning how to cook a good recipe. Maybe you're a letter of the law type cooker. By that, I mean that you follow the recipe exactly how it says, and then when it comes out, voila, you know, it's done. You make a good meal. But as you grow in your cooking skills, it's actually interesting we prayed about Kate and culinary school tonight because this fits in well. As you get better at cooking, perhaps, and I'm not really that great at cooking, so I wouldn't be the type of person to do this, but you could find out the types of spices and ingredients that will help add appropriate flavor to the dish. So you learn to add a little bit of this or a little bit of that. And perhaps you don't even use a recipe anymore. You just know it by heart. You know, grandma's secret recipes that she never wrote down. But you don't get there magically overnight. How did you get there? By cooking. And it's the same way with loving others in the body of Christ. We learn to love by loving. As we read the Bible and apply it, as we learn more about how God loves us, the Holy Spirit illumines our hearts and teaches us how to show love. We learn how to apply the principles of Scripture, how to best love others. And no one is the master chef. We're all being taught by Jesus Christ how to love better. But the only way you're going to learn to love is by loving. You know, every situation is different, right? Because we're, we're all different. Every person may have a different way they approach things. So you, you might be in a situation where you need to step in and help somebody and provide really practical help just picking up groceries without even asking, you know, just going and doing something for them. But there might be another person who doesn't really want the practical help. They're just struggling with a friend to come alongside and give some godly counsel, a sounding board, someone you can talk to. There might be another person who, though they may not see it, needs a confrontation or a rebuke. We're not saying that love is soft or frilly. It has a spine to it. You know, another person may simply need encouragement. You know, we need wisdom. We need skill in life to learn how to love well. And there's a passage in Scripture that really helps us pray that way. Paul says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being. Why? Why is the Holy Spirit working in our hearts? Why are we praying for this? So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. You see how this works? As we grow in our love for God and we learn more of his love for us, it then empowers us to love others better. 
So this prayer in Ephesians chapter 3 is another practical way. You could just apply it in your devotional life. Take some of these prayer passages from Paul, like this one on love, and ask God to make this true in your own life. Ask him to make it true in the lives of others that we would not just know the love of God in our heads, but in our hearts. Not just talking about it with our lips, but showing it in our lives. And as we do, we come back to God time and time again. You know, there have been times when I've tried to cook a recipe from memory, but then I've discovered it's probably better just to go back to the book. And that's what we need, right? There's a world of a difference between baking soda and baking powder, as I discovered one time. That was a fun day. And in the same way, we need to come back to God's word time and time again and be reminded of who is anchoring us in this process. We need to look to Jesus. So here's another passage that we know well, but you would do well to memorize and quote regularly and pray through. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You are secure, Christian, because of the unshakable love of Jesus Christ. He is a rock for us. And because you have, he has loved you, you can love him back, and he can empower you to love others more. So let's commit to do that. We have covenanted to walk together daily in Christian love and compassion because it truly is the will of God. This is the most important command we could ever consider, so do not take it lightly. Instead, ask God for the grace this week to love others as he has loved you. Let's commit to doing that together. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for these simple yet essential words from Scripture. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we, we realize that we fall far short of the great love that you've shown to us. And when we realize that, we come back to you confessing our sin and are reminded yet again of your unshakable love for us in Jesus Christ. Thank you so much that you have loved us so much that you sent your son to die on the cross for our sins. Thank you that your love is unchanging. Though we're fickle and we waver back and forth in our love for you and for others, you, you never wavered. Though we grow weary and tired and our resolve to love wanes, Lord, yours is steady and constant and unchanging. Thank you so much that day by day we can come back to you and find grace so that we can serve you and accomplish this command. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us as a church body to meditate on these truths, not just to hear it in this sermon and to walk away unchanged, but Lord, I pray that you would help someone to take the passage of Paul in prayer and to use that in their devotional life, that it would really change them. Lord, I pray help someone to Memorize 1 Corinthians 13 and begin quoting it and, and thinking through how that's true of Jesus and how he can make it true of them. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to consider even our own speech. How do we talk about one another? How do we talk about other Christians, Lord? The world will know that we are your disciples by our love for one another. So I pray, please help us in this very essential matter that we would be salt and light in America that people would know here that God's people love one another. We're so grateful, Lord, for this challenge. And we pray that you would help us to become more like Jesus because you have loved us first. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's another hymn that we haven't sung in, in quite a while, but this is a song as I was growing up as a child in Farmington, Michigan at our church. We sang this song every single month right after the Lord's Supper, and we had Lord's Supper in the evening. But I remember, but I only, we only sang the first verse. But this is a, a great hymn. There's not that many hymns that talk about our love for each other and serving each other. 
but this one does. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. Let's stand together and sing. Bless you, you're dismissed.